Okay, well, thank you very much for <clears throat> that nice introduction. A uh, couple of uh, issues. When I got through with my talk yesterday, my wife chastised me because she said I kept turning away from the microphone to look at the, the slides and that she couldn't hear. So if you uh, have a problem, just scream out Mike, because that's not only my name, it, it'll remind me. <laughs> number one. And number two, uh, I did a stupid thing. I had cobbled all these slides together and I kind of didn't look like the way it looked because I'd done the other talk first and I liked it a lot better, so I decided on the plane, I think I'm gonna change the format. Bad move. <laughs> Took me forever and I didn't get it done and I was in a blind panic and I was up at 4.15 today trying to do this. So it's the same thing, it's just a different format, but near the end, you'll see the format switch over. So anyway, that's what happened. I just ran out of time and I wanted to see the talks today, so I didn't wanna set up in the room and keep going. So anyway, we're gonna talk about paleopathology and the origins of the low carb diet. And <clears throat> whenever I talk about this, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm always reminded of this kind of stupid joke about people back where I grew up in the Ozarks in Missouri, which were the real Ozarks. Now, do they have Ozarks on TV here? Is that a serious? Yeah, well, that's the Northern Ozarks. It gets worse when you go South. <laughs> so, the closer you get to Arkansas, the real, the more Ozarkian it gets. And a couple of guys down there who were, you know, hillbillies, but they were really good on standardized tests, and they ended up uh, scoring well and getting into an Ivy League university. And so they go to the Ivy League university, and they get in there, and one of the first classes that they're in together, there's a project that this guy says, okay, the professor says, I want you all to come up with a, uh, the eighth wonder of the world. What's the eighth wonder of the world? So everybody turned in this assignment. It was a whole semester deal. And they, uh, uh, you know, people were putting the jet engine, the computer chip, all this stuff. And these two guys come up with the thermos bottle. And the professor sees this thing, he says, the thermos bottle? And so he calls him in because he doesn't want to embarrass him. And he says, what, uh, what's this deal with the thermos bottle? Why is that the eighth wonder of the world? One of them says, well, you know, if you put something hot in it, it keeps it hot. He goes, yeah. And if you put something cold in it, it keeps it cold. He goes, okay. But how does it know? <laughs> <laughs> and when we... And we talk about the, <laughs> the diet of ancient man, you know, the same question arises, how do we know? How do we know what ancient man ate? And that's what we're gonna talk about here because ancient man basically ate a low carbohydrate diet and when he didn't, he got into trouble. So the, uh, and so how do you know? These are different ways that you know, and we're gonna touch on a couple of those, not all of them, but there are many different ways that you can determine what people ate. People make their whole career out of butcher mark analysis and, uh, and dental calculus studies. So there's, there's this wealth of kind of intellectual information out there where people can look at this uh, and, and tell you what people a million years ago ate. Now, this is from a horrible paper, but this is the one good sentence out of it. And this is our physiology should be optimized to the diet that we've experienced during our evolutionary past. And that is absolutely true. And here's a book called Strong Medicine by Blake Donaldson. Uh, if you're politically correct, don't come anywhere near it because it's totally unpolitically correct. And Blake Donaldson was an old guy that practiced in New York, and he was influenced by Wilhelmer Stefansson, uh, and he converted all of his patients to basically carnivore diets. And he made this comment that I love, that's during the millions of years that our ancestors lived by hunting, every weakling who could not maintain perfect health on fresh fat meat and water was bred out. <laughs> This, uh, another quote by Mark Nathan Cohen, the field of medicine often appears naive about the full range of human biological experience basing conclusions about human health, even about what's normal on the comparatively narrow experience of contemporary Western society. Now, I wanna talk about one of the, the great intellectual uh, achievements that I think has ever been made in this field. And this was done by Leslie Aiello and Peter Wheeler. And they wrote this up in Current Anthropology uh, back in the 1990s. And I talked to Leslie Aiello about it about 15 years ago. I met her at a conference and we had a chat about this. And she said they had 
a hell of a time getting this paper published. Uh, the uh, current anthropology didn't want to publish it. And so they worked through the whole thing and they finally got him to publish it. And now it's the most cited paper in the history of the journal. But they, these guys did a brilliant job on this. And what they did is they started out with Kleiber's Law. Now, Max Kleiber is an old physiologist from the University of California at Davis. He was there for a million years. He wrote this book called The Fire of Life. He wrote a bunch of papers, but he called this book called The Fire of Life, which that's my copy right there. And you can have a copy, too, for about a mere $275. I got mine years and years and years ago when it was less expensive. But anyway, Kleiber came up with this thing that's called, he called the law of constraints. And one of the things Kleiber did was he went all over weighing different animals and looking at their metabolic rate. And he found out that they laid right on this line, almost every mammal out there, doesn't matter if it's a rat, it doesn't matter if it's an elephant, a horse, a dog, a cat, a guinea pig, there are just a few exceptions and they all lie on this line. And that's what he called the line of metabolic constraints. And if you look at, uh, if you look at humans, they lay right on that line too, in terms of their uh, metabolic rate versus their weight. But if you look over here, you can see that their brain is way different. It's way higher than everything else. And brain is really expensive metabolically. And so it got them thinking about that. And here again, human males and females fit on the, the, the uh, on that line. And so what Aelo and Wheeler did is they, they looked at this and they said, okay, what happened? How can we be on this line when we've got this hugely energetic brain? Because your brain is about two to three percent of your body weight, and yet it gobbles up about 25 percent of your energy. So how did that work? And what they, they concluded was that in order for the brain to expand and stay on this line, this Kleiber line, something had to give. And the liver couldn't give, the heart couldn't give, the kidneys couldn't give, and what gave was the gut. And so they had a smaller gut to allow this larger brain and maintain the human on this line. And you can see it graphically over here. The brain got larger and the gut got smaller. And that was, uh, you know, that was what they had figured out. And you can see it in this, in human evolution right here, is that brain size really increased uh, in time. And we're, you know, up at the upper left right now. Now, uh, in the gut, in the olden days, and this is uh, this is some work again from well, this is actually some work from Lauren Cordain, but to to get 65% of your nutrients or your energy from plant foods, this is what you would have to eat. It's a huge amount of food in a day, and this is modern food. This has been Luther Burbank. These are not ancient foods. If you're talking about ancient foods, it's a lot more than that because they've got a lot more fiber and a lot less energy content. And so what you can see is if you look at these rib cages, uh, you can see the one that's on the left is a chimpanzee. The one on the right is Australopithecus affer uh, afarensis, which is Lucy. And you can see the big wide torso because that, or a rib cage, because that held a great big belly. And the same thing with the chimpanzee and the human torso is narrow because the gut is smaller. And if you look at here, you've got a, a human on the left and an australopithecine on the right, and you can see the difference in gut content between a human and a much smaller australopithecine because they ate more plants than we did. And you can see it in a chimpanzee, and you can also see it in a gorilla. And this is a real, honest to God, hunter gather, a, a Norwegian physician back in the uh, mid 1930s went to deepest darkest interior of Denmark looking for Inuit who had not been uh, been polluted with a Western diet and he found a bunch of them in there and, and he got pictures of a whole bunch of them and this is one so you can see a true hunter gatherer uh, abdominal uh, capacity compared to a gorilla and a chimpanzee and the theory on why we developed this brain is because we ate a lot of fat. And where do we get the fat? We got the fat because we were scavengers. Early man was a scavenger, and they can see that on the tooth marks. They can see it, on, I mean, on the, on the butcher marks. They can see it where they used stones to crush uh, 
uh, bones to get marrow, which high fat and brains and animals, you know, lions don't eat the marrow and they don't eat the brains, but that's left to our ancient ancestors. And so they ate this fat rich diet and that allowed them to grow their ba- uh, brains and fat digest much more easily than plant foods do. And it's a much more dense energy source. So it allowed them to shrink their guts while they expanded their brain. Now, here is uh, some work done by a young archaeologist or anthropologist in Africa, and she looked at uh, what was left over from lion kills. And she looked at zebras and she looked at wildebeest. And what she found out was that uh, this graph on the top is the, the number of lions. If there was just one or two lions, uh, there was a lot of, of meat left over. If there were a lot of lions, there wasn't a lot of meat left over. And what she found out was that a wildebeest carcass after a lion kill gave enough energy of of four Big Macs. And a zebra carcass was 11 Big Macs. So there was plenty left over just in flesh. And this doesn't include the marrow and the brain. So there's plenty of stuff for our ancient ancestors to, to scavenge. Now here is kind of a progression uh, from Australopithecus afarensis, which is the earliest human that really we know that worked, walked upright, started to develop a, a hand that, that had an opposable thumb and was the transition from sort of the forest to the savanna as the climate was changing back then. And yes, there was climate change four million years ago. And this is Lucy, and this is, uh, you know, went from there to Africanus, and I put these things in with the relative sizes of the skulls so you can see the brains grow. And this is uh, Astropithus africanus. This is Homo habilis, the tool maker. Uh, this is uh, Homo ergaster. This is uh, erectus. And there's all kinds of, of fighting amongst anthropologists about who went where, but it kind of gradually all went in this direction and it ended up with uh, us, Homo sapiens. Now there was another branch in this whole progression. And this branch went this way, and this went to Australopithecus robustus. And then this branch kind of went, nobody knows, well, we know where, but it it puzzled anthropologists for a long time because the issue with this was that, and here's the robustus skull, and if you look at what, what they found out on these skulls is that the skulls became both more primitive and more modern and their dating showed them to be younger than, than, than their predecessor, the Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, and so they were actually a, a, an evolutionary step beyond that, but everything looked more primitive. They had big molars. And one of the things that during this whole evolutionary process is our, our brain, our skull, uh, cavities got larger and our jaws and teeth got smaller. And these, their teeth, got bigger and their their mouths looked different and they had but they had this rounded uh, palate which is a more modern thing and they couldn't figure it out and so finally they they got the services of somebody that does the uh, tooth analysis of abrasion analysis on the tools and these guys said well they were vegetarians they ate just a bunch of vegetable stuff and you can tell by the tooth marks that they ate twigs and they ate uh, plant matter and so what ended up happening, and so you can see robustus on the top and africanus on the bottom. Africanus is much more gracile. Robustus is really robust. You can see the two skulls side by side, and you can see that big area where they had this big muscle that came through to this ridge that attached there and came down through the zygomatic process to get the jaw so that they could you know, crunch up this heavy plant food. And so what ended up happening is they just came to an evolutionary dead end. They didn't go on any farther. They died out. And so that's, uh, you know, this is plant-based man. And so when, <laughs> when anybody suggests to you that you should follow an, uh, a vegetarian diet, you can kind of say, been there, done that about three million years ago, and it didn't work. So let's move on to stable isotope analysis because this is probably the most accurate way we have of knowing what ancient man ate. And elements with different atomic mass are called isotopes. It's a difference of the the number of neutrons in the nucleus. 
and you've got carbon 12, which is the most common. You've got carbon 13, you've got carbon 14. These are all carbon isotopes. Carbon 14 doesn't count because it degrades. It's not stable, and that's why we use this for carbon dating. You've got nitrogen 14, which is the normal. You've got nitrogen 15. I screwed that one up. Uh, that... Um, is is the the stable isotope you can you can look at these uh, uh you you can put these through a mass spectrometer and you can tell what the stable isotopes are and they don't change and you can compare them to a standard so this is delta 13 carbon that's the change in carbon 13 and it's measured in parts per thousand they call it per mil and we'll race through this so what does it all mean? It's found, C13 is found in greater quantities in marine animals and in terrestrial animals. And a higher 13 indicates a diet higher in seafood. And over time, because early man was a hunter and would, would, would decimate the large game animals. And as, over time, as these large game animals became more and more decimated, early man moved more and more to the ocean and to streams and started eating diets that were higher in, uh, in, in marine foods. And so you can see that in this higher carbon-13. You can also see a carbon-3 versus carbon-4 analysis. And, and carbon-4 plants are, you know, are fruits and rice and beans, carbon-3 or corn and sugar cane and things like that. And you can see over time, early on, you had mainly carbon-3. And at the end, you have all this maize that, that uh, people were eating. But the, the Delta-15 tells the carnivory story. Plants contain a fairly constant uh, nitrogen 15, when herbivores eat plants, they concentrate this, this N15 by about three to 5% in their collagen. So if a collagen capital contains greater than 5% than the local flora, you know that the animal is an herbivore because it's been eating the local flora, it's concentrated the nitrogen 15. And then you've got this, this kind of trophic level thing. You've got the cow that eats the grass, so it's going to concentrate the nitrogen. Then you've got a, a baboon. There, I couldn't find an African animal to put in there, so I put a cow. So I doubt that baboons eat cows, but they do eat meat, and so they concentrate it too. So they're the next level up. Uh, they're the the. the the carnivores basically and then you get the the lions that eat the baboons and eat the cows and they're the hyper carnivores and when you look at the neanderthals uh, and you check out what they ate, you can see that that their uh, neanderthal one and neanderthal two are on the far right and the arctic fox and the wolf are right next to them and they actually are are more carnivorous than foxes and wolves. And the foxes are mainly totally carnivorous. And you can see the herbivores down to the left. So those are the Neanderthals. So what did modern humans eat? They were essentially the same thing. They were even more hyper carnivores. You can see the, uh, the auric and the wild horse and the red deer. And then you can see it jump up on the green to the Arctic fox. And then you can see these, these ancient humans that are over on the right. And so they were hyper carnivores. And these are not cherry picked studies. These are Michael Richards, and he's probably the top guy on this. He's at the Max Planck Institute. And he does all of this uh, stable isotope analysis. He's the real old timer in it. And uh, he's kind of a friend of mine. We've talked about this. And, and I checked with him, and he said, yeah, the data's the same. The more we find, it just confirms what we've already found. So these are not cherry, cherry picked samples. And early man ate things like this. I mean, and they hunted them down with sharp sticks. So you can imagine what, how much they wanted meat to be able to go after something like that. And if you ever go to the, the Museum of Natural History in New York City, they've probably got one here too, but the one in New York City, there's a whole floor of animals that are, that are skeletal remains of animals like this. They're huge. And ancient man hunted every single one to extinction. So he really wanted meat. Now let's take a, a for you there. I usually, when I talk about this, I talk about a group of uh, ancient Americans. My, my wife is going to talk about that when she gives her talk. Uh, so I'm going to switch to the ancient Egyptian diet because the ancient Egyptian diet is interesting because we know what they ate. The record is, is really uh, uh, pretty much complete on that. And what they uh, and what they ate was a modern what we'd call a modern nutritionist nirvana. Now you're going to see a lot of these little figurines. One time uh, we were in Paris, and my wife took her sister, who was 
with us and they went to Versailles and I didn't want to go anywhere near it because it's always packed with people. So I went to the Louvre and stumbled onto this, this great exhibit of ancient Egypt and they had 10 zillion of these little figurines of people grinding wheat and making bread and I almost OD'd on them. And so you're probably <laughs> going to OD on them too in this talk and because they just, there were just cases after cases after cases of them. And so Bread was a real staple of the Egyptian diet, and it was coarse ground whole wheat bread, typically emmer wheat, so it's an ancient breed of wheat. It's not the new dwarf wheat. Uh, the most important food of the Egyptians was bread. The fondness of Egyptians for bread was so well known that they were nicknamed artophagoi, or eaters of bread by the Greeks, and their troops were rationed four pounds of this you know, stone ground uh, uh, whole wheat bread daily. And they also, uh, you know, they trapped waterfowl that went along the Nile. They, uh, they fished, so they got a little fish, they got a little fowl with their diet, but it was mainly a plant-based diet. And you can see them harvesting wheat there. And it was primarily carbohydrates. It was breads, fruits, vegetables, honeys, oil, olive flaxseed, safflower, sesame. And they had some fish and waterfowl and occasionally red meat when they sacrificed an animal. Mainly they, they used the animals as beasts of burden. They used them to plow the ground. They used them to, you know, to pull carts around. They didn't raise them to eat them, but they ate them on occasion. And so the ancient Egyptian diet, just what I said, uh, fowl appear to have been abundant about hens and roosters. We can say only that is it is still their want that they seem to have been all over the place. When you see Egyptian hieroglyphics, they're all thin and they're all, you know, they have their, they all look like they're svelte, and, but their statuary is different. They kind of showed the statuary as they really were. And here's a guy, an Egyptian guy, and I want you to notice that he's got breasts and he's got a big belly, but they had the breasts because they ate so much wheat. They got so much phytoestrogen that all the men had breasts. And if you look at just statue after statue, here's another one, bellies and boobs. Here's another one, bellies and boobs. Now this is a female, you expect that on a female, but here's another male, look at that. This guy's proud of it, bellies and boobs. That was the, uh, you know, that was the Egyptian way. And they ate all this bread and, and this is what they looked like in actuality, not what you see on the hieroglyphics. So the Egyptians did have uh, another one. Uh, Egyptians did have an obesity problem, and the, the, this whole uh, field of Egypt, uh, Egyptian paleopathology, or the dissection of mummies, uh, was started by a guy named Sir Armand Rufer, who was um, a British uh, microbiologist and anatomist, and he was in Cairo around the turn of the century, and he actually did autopsies of mummies. And what he discovered when he did them, and he would do these drawings, so he had kind of one eye on the scope and the other eye on a piece of paper, and he draw, drew these things, and he discovered that Egyptians, ancient Egyptians were riddled with heart disease. Now remember, the diet that they're eating, remember what we talked about, it's all wheat, it's all these vegetable oils, it's honey, it's very little meat, and yet the, the very, they were riddled with heart disease. And he says, I can't therefore at present give any reason why arterial disease should have been so prevalent in ancient Egypt. And again, this was 1200 years before sugar was even on the scene. I think, however, that it's interesting to find that it was common and that 3000 years ago, it represented the same anatomical characteristics as it does now. So it looked just like it does now. And then you've got the Ebers papyrus. And the Ebers Papyrus from 1550 BC says, if thou examinest a man for illness in his cardia, and he has pains in his arms and in his breast and in one side of his cardia, it is death threatening him. I mean, that could be right out of a, a cardiology book today. I mean, they're describing a heart attack. So obviously they had heart attacks in ancient Egypt. And here's a picture, I need to somehow outline this thing, but this is in a journal and it said maybe the first uh, depiction of, of sudden death in, uh, in you know, art. And you can see it, the, the guy's down and everybody's comforting the wife and he's laying down and they're all trying to comfort him. And so that probably was a fairly common Common occurrence. Now, we can start looking at, at what we find when we analyze these mummies. And this uh, has Shepset, who was a famous queen in 1500 BC. And when you, when you look at her, she had terrible teeth 
and you can see what maybe even a little bit of an abscess down there. Uh, this is what she looked like in her statuary when she was younger. She ruled for a long time. And so tooth disease was really common in Egypt. And you can see how these teeth are ground down. You notice that? That's a common thing you see in mummies. And it's because when they, when they did the bread, they would put sand in it to help grind it. And then they would try to sift the sand out as much as they could. And the better qualities of bread had less sand and people back then even advertised, you know, our bread has less sand than his bread does. And, <laughs> but eating this bread as much as they did with these little sand particles in would grind down their teeth. And so you can see this in, uh, in uh, almost every mummy that you look at. And here's another one. Uh, this is a, uh, Edentulous, but you can see, see how the teeth are ground down. And there's another picture of it. You can see how the teeth are ground down. You can see how they're eroded away. You can see how they're, they're cavity ridden. And there's a good look at it. That's a, that's a classic look of uh, Egyptian mummy teeth. And now they look at mummies in, uh, with CT scans now instead of autopsying them. And this is Lady Rye, who was a lady in waiting. She was in her early 30s, and already she was developing vascular disease. And this is another one from a cardiology journal. You can see the, the carotid artery uh, uh, atherosclerosis. There's the left coronary, there's the right coronary. You can see the LAX. So it's not that these people were without disease eating the diet that most nutritionists would have us eat today. If somebody said, if you really want to be healthy, get some emmer wheat, eat a lot of coarse stone ground whole wheat bread, a little olive oil, a little sesame oil, don't eat very much meat, you'll live forever. Well, it didn't work for them. <laughs> and when you look for in the mummies, you find on this slide, that 15% under 30 years old, 15% of people had uh, uh, signs of arterial sclerosis. 30 to 39 years, almost 35%. If they were 40 to 49 years, over 50% of them had it. And when they got older, it's probably a survival effect, uh, uh, you know, a little, a little under 40 had it. Now, this is one of my favorite articles. It's about atherosclerosis in the diet of ancient Egypt. And these morons that did this thing looked at that and, and they, you know, they said, because everybody knows now, there are a million articles out there if you look them up on arteriosclerosis and heart disease in ancient Egyptians. These people said, okay, why is this? Why did they all have heart disease? And they made this, um, this leap and they said, the vast bibliography associated with the examination of Egyptian mummies provides overwhelming evidence that atheroma was seen in a variety of vascular beds, which is absolutely true. And so then they said, clear evidence of vascular calcification, the finding associated with accelerated atherosclerosis and increased incidence of coronary artery disease. Okay, I'll buy that. And then they say, the explanation for these frequent pathological findings almost certainly resides in a diet rich in saturated fat because they're so eaten up with this idea that saturated fat causes heart disease. So they're trying to reverse engineer it. Well, they had heart disease. So they must have eaten saturated fat and they didn't. And they were saying so. But all this is in the elite because the elite were mummified and the others weren't. Well, that's not true. The elite had elaborate mummification process, but there are zillions of other mummies out there that have been analyzed as well. And when you look at, uh, uh, and so they, they conclude uh, that there's unequivocal evidence to show that atherosclerosis is a disease, a disease of ancient times induced by diet, and that the epidemic of atherosclerosis, which began, began in the 20th century, is nothing more than history revisiting us because now we're eating saturated fats like the Egyptians did. And if you do a stable isotope analysis, because the minute I read that paper, I figured there's bound to be a stable isotope analysis, so I'm looking for it, and sure enough, there was. And it said uh, that there were really no differences between the social classes. So poor, rich, it didn't matter. Uh, they all looked the same. It, you know, that there were no class differences, and there was an equal amount of, of uh, atherosclerosis in the two classes. And so our physiology should be optimized to the diet that we've experienced our evolutionary past. That's absolutely true. And so 
If you look at the metabolic constraints of Kleiber's law, stable isotope analysis, the hunter versus the farmer, which my wife's going to talk about, the ancient Egyptian data, and even the modern uh, randomized control trials, they all point in one direction. Cut the carbs. <laughs> you cut the carbs, you're going to do better. They would have done a lot better. So I thank you very much for your time. <laughs>